So based on a little video you saw for the Now Testament, it's probably not going to be any surprise what scripture passages we're looking at this morning. Well, <clears throat> of course, we're looking at the story of creation in Genesis to try and understand how it is used to deny science. Well, actually, Gary, those who swear that Genesis is the exact way God made the world would never say they are denying science. If you were watching that video closely, they claim their own science, and they insist a tremendous body of scientific knowledge and theory held by the vast majority of the scientific community, and I would venture the vast majority of people in this sanctuary, that we are simply wrong, and that we are wrong by hundreds of millions, if not billions, of years. So, creation science, or intelligent design as it is often called, claims the world was literally made in six days. I believe it reads like this. First, God created light. Then the dome of the sky. Then God separated out dry land from water and brought forth vegetation. Next, God made night and day by calling forth the moon with the stars and the sun. Next, God called forth the creatures, all the creatures that swim and fly. Finally, God called forth the land creatures of all kind, ultimately creating humans on that sixth day, at which point God breathed life into Adam, then made Eve from his rib, and then we know how the rest of the story of the Garden of Eden unfolds. Oh, yes and then God rested. Well, it's a little hard for me to think of this as science, but basically that is the, the body, the scriptures that are used to support creation science. And in summarizing that, you actually named one of the first problems we see trying to place a scientific overlay on scripture like this, because there are actually two distinct stories here. Two stories that were put into writing hundreds of years apart by two different traditions within Judaism with two very distinct views of what God is like. The story of Adam and Eve in the garden, a story we know well, comes from the Yahwist tradition. It's actually the older of the two stories, and God is a very intimate presence. God is personal and involved. God walks in the Garden of Eden. God breathes life into Adam. <coughs> and along with Eve, the two of them become central to this story. If you read very carefully in chapter 2 of Genesis, Adam is made before the other creatures in order to keep him company. And then eventually Eve is fashioned from his rib, so he'll have a real partner. But the creation story that is told first in Genesis chapter 1, humans are made at the same time. Male and female are made together. And God makes them, and everything else is in place before they are created. If you look up there, humanity comes last. In the other story, humanity comes way before the other animals. It's just an interesting thing to notice. The stories are different. And in this story of the seven days to make creation, God is this huge, powerful God that doesn't particularly act per, interact personally with this creation, but speaks it into existence. This is a very different kind of God who looks on all of creation and sees that it is good. Now, if you've never looked into Genesis chapters 1 and 2, Seriously, go home this afternoon, just open your Bible for a few minutes and read them, and you will feel the difference that comes as that second story is told. And then just give thanks for those early editors who um, had the wisdom to keep both of those stories in the scripture so that we could see that at different times in Jewish history, there were different and shifting understandings of what God is like. Now, just as what happens with the Christmas story, Sometimes these two stories get homogenized into one. That's what you saw on the Now Testament, where the Adam and Eve story and the story of creation, as well as the story of the ark, all get rolled in together. Um, what I want to mention is, if you recall when we've talked about the Christmas stories, you know that there really are two pretty distinct Christmas stories. One in which uh, Jesus is born in a stable and the message is given by angels to the shepherds who come and worship. 
A separate story in Matthew says that wise men coming from a distance came and found the baby, who, uh, the child who was perhaps two years old by then, by following the star. When we have Christmas pageants, we smush those two things together, and we've got the star over the stable and the kings and the shepherds all huddling around the baby in the manger. We homogenize those stories when, in fact, they're there in our scriptures distinctly to tell us different kinds of things from different points of view. That's the kind of problem we have when we homogenize these two stories about creation. It's important to see those distinct points of view. So, most of us would say these stories in Genesis are a way of describing reality, the truth about the way things are in this world, how God engages us, why and how we lose our way. But they aren't meant to be read as factual accounts. I guess this whole disagreement comes down to, yet again, how one reads the Bible. Well, I think you're right, and that's a problem that we're familiar with, how one reads the Bible. I would like you to read the one final verse this morning, a verse from Romans um, 1, verse 20. And I think it's something that maybe could speak to everybody about, um, everybody who's a follower of Jesus anyway, about this idea of creation. This is Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 20. Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible as they are, have been understood and seen through things God has made. Let me repeat. Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible as they are, have been understood and seen through things that God has made. Thank you, Gary. Now, besides the creation story I just mentioned a moment ago, there's another epic story in in scripture. Most notably, that story would be the story of Noah's Ark, the Great Flood. And it is hugely important in trying to understand intelligent design or creation science, as it likes to call itself. Geologists and archaeologists and other kind of scientists agree that there was a great flood in the middle of the eastern region long ago, the Mesopotamian Valley. It did not envelop the whole world, but it may have enveloped the known world. And the story of Noah's Ark is a story to explain that flood. There's also stories in other cultures in that area, different stories that are their attempts to explain that flood, why it happened and what God was doing. Now, um, creation science says that it did in fact cover the whole planet. If the world is only six, maybe 10,000 years old, and that's the oldest they think it is, then it looked much different in form than we think, as people who think of the Earth evolved over a long period of time. So at the time of the flood, there were very few mountains and valleys, so it took far less water, far less time to cover the entire planet. All the peaks and valleys that we claim took hundreds of millions of billions of years are simply the result of that flood. If you accept this idea, then you accept the basis for creation science. If you deny this idea, if you think, as many of us do, that science and religion are two different kinds of investigators, descriptions of the world and life, with two different ways of approaching questions, often very different questions. If that's what you think, then you are denying God. So there is the gap for us. The gap for us is not in this room between religion and science. We don't even see that gap. The gap is between the Christian who sees no gap and the Christians who believe that the scientific community is simply wrong, and so are we. Is there anything we can say or do to bridge a gap like that? Frankly, I'm not entirely sure. I loved the image last week that our youth brought into this discussion about gaps in the world, where they used the symbol of the drawbridge. If both sides would lower their part of the bridge, there's a place to talk and converse and find some common ground. <coughs> but in fact, I'm not sure that when one side is absolutely sure they are right, there's much room for conversation, and that side of the drawbridge just isn't gonna come down. 
So that image isn't going to work in this case. I stepped back a couple of weeks to the way I preached about standing in the gap, being the bridge, something I wrote about for the paper yesterday, the Idaho paper. If we use that image, then we can sort of fill in that gap and try to bridge it with our lives, but we may be standing in that gap just kind of talking with each other, to tell you the truth. And yet, I have to say, this issue is all around us. Just listen to Boise Radio, and you're going to hear again and again the conversation about how we must get creation science in our schools, about how if we can't do that, then we should pull our children out of public schools and teach them privately because this is a godless society. You don't have to go to Kentucky to find good people pushing on this topic. Facts are not going to influence or persuade. Our facts are simply unacceptable. I have been asking myself in good faith all week, okay, if I had a chance to say something on this topic to somebody who totally disagreed with me, what would I say? How would I approach that? And it's one of the reasons why I asked Gary to read that little verse from Romans. I sort of like what it says if you get to the heart of it. Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible as they are, have been understood and seen through the things God has made. What this says to me, what it might be able to say to someone who disagrees with me, is that you really don't have to prove that Scripture is correct by making the world fit it. The world itself speaks for God. Maybe it's a small way to affirm scripture as a source of wisdom and let the planet and the cosmos simply speak and let us discover what is there to learn. Seriously, whether we're talking about science or any other divisive issue in our world, I think maybe the best we can do is keep reminding ourselves and reminding others through our lives that God speaks any way God wants. And here's the kicker. God is not limited by Scripture. God is not limited by Scripture. I believe this is true. And being a good Methodist, I have support for that belief. John Wesley taught that Scripture always needed to be informed by three things. One of those is reason. Hello? Reason. Let the natural world speak. Experience is the second one. We all have unique experiences and information that we can bring to the table with complicated and controversial topics. Let the experience speak as well. And thirdly is tradition or history. What's happened in the past because of how we have understood and lived out scripture? Should, does this have something to teach us for how we are living now? I think immediately of Galileo and the way the church denied his findings. Now, using scripture in conjunction with our reason, our experience, and looking at the past, at history, this isn't just smart. This is wise. This is wise because there is so much we do not know. Almost every evening, if you live in the San Francisco Bay Area, a great fog rolls in and sits on the beautiful Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. The bridge is still there, but it disappears into that fog. Even those of us who trust facts and who are walking with Jesus realize that we too are sometimes walking in the fog. There is always more to learn. There is always something new to discover. God can speak anytime, any way God wants because God is not limited by Scripture. That's what I think maybe we have to offer, that willingness to say that and that willingness to discover and name how God still speaks around us. Our God is like that God who walked in the garden and breathed life into Adam. Our God is the God who spoke the world and our awareness of it into existence. And our God is the God who just loves us and that matters more than anything we know or believe or think we know. 
And so we do still stand in that gap with our arms extended. And sometimes that gap is full of fog. And our task is to keep ourselves open to how God speaks anytime, any way God wants. Amen.